and um, just like to welcome uh, particularly Dawn and Aiko to this session and James is going to talk for uh, 20 minutes or so but as it's a small group here if you want to ask questions uh, on the way he will be very happy to to answer them. Uh, over to you James. Thank you very much. Okay so that's just the title page as you can see on the screen there. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about who I am and where I work. So I'm working in, um, in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City for RMIT Vietnam. RMIT is actually an Australian university with three campuses in Vietnam, one here in Ho Chi Minh City, which is the biggest, and then uh, much smaller campuses up in Hanoi and Da Nang. Uh, I work for the School of English and University Pathways. Uh, we have a maximum class size of 20, and our students join us for 20 hours a week uh, across 10-week programs split via reading and writing, listening and speaking. Uh, and we have courses everywhere from beginner to advanced as uh, academic English program, uh, pre-sessional courses. Uh, but today I'm not really talking about our teaching, I'm talking about our professional development through mentoring. And I just added a bit more information there about our uh, teaching staff. So we have 96 teachers across Vietnam, but about 80 of them are based here in Saigon. And we have 60% of our staff as educators and approximately 40% senior educator. And that's what I'll be focusing on today, the relationship between those educators and senior educators. Uh, okay, so just, just a brief overview of what I will be doing today. I am loath to read off slides, so I will just give you a moment. Uh, so some background into why I'm sharing this information today. Basically, as a senior educator, which I am myself, we were always expected to mentor our colleagues. So whether that was other educators or other senior educators, we were always expected to mentor as part of our job description. It's why we're senior educators to support, to support the managers in supporting teachers. But there wasn't really any structure to it. It was sort of, oh, okay, have you done your mentoring? Yep, all right. Um, and there wasn't much training in the area. So our upper management identified a gap and wanted to find a way to uh, introduce better mentoring systems. So they sent myself and a few other colleagues off to some formal training uh, with the sort of mission of bringing any learning back and sharing it forward. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today more. So we were tasked with a project after receiving this training of using the knowledge to introduce um, some better mentoring systems and better mentoring training. So the first step is we went to our staff and we conducted a, a needs analysis and we did that mostly with newer teachers uh, to find out where they thought knowledge was lacking in their induction process. And also with our senior educators to find out where they thought they needed more support. And yeah, we found a lot of gaps. So what we did is we went away across probably nearly a six month period. And we sat down just two of us and we worked through some ideas. We obviously did some more research and used that training to develop a, a much more structured program of mentoring, which I'll talk about a bit more soon. And also training for our senior educators to, to help them actually be better mentors. And ultimately we decided on something somewhat formalized, but we really wanted to keep it as a pair-mentoring relationship. And, and now I'll talk about why we chose pair-mentoring. I'll just give you a moment to read the quote on the screen. So receiving mentoring or coaching from a line manager will always have an element of evaluation to it. Whereas pair mentoring enables senior and junior staff to learn a more, in a more reciprocal way. 
neither staff member in our mentoring relationships are responsible for line management or evaluation of staff. So all elements of evaluation are removed from our process. This ultimately allows for a more honest relationship, improving rapport and trust, which in turn allows for greater professional development as teachers. The focus here is not on career development, but on improving teaching approaches. So the system that we put together matches all new teachers with a senior educator. And those matchings are made based on teaching experience. So for example, if someone comes in and they're going to be doing advanced reading and writing, we match them with someone with experience, recent experience teaching advanced reading and writing. Uh, they follow a really robust checklist and it was created in collaboration with various stakeholders to, sorry, to ensure all important areas of the school are covered. So we have a lot of systems, we have a lot of admin and in addition to our teaching and it can be a bit overwhelming. So we introduced this checklist for both the sake of the mentors to make sure nothing's missed and the sake of the mentees so they have something to refer to. Um, we also encourage the mentors to set goals, weekly goals with their mentees. And this is, this is to address any perceived areas of weakness and is often where that more reciprocal learning can take place because mentors are, you know, mentors need to reflect on their own teaching uh, when setting these goals, when giving advice. And often we, we hire very experienced teachers anyway. So they often have great perspectives to bring in and, and ultimately improve the quality of teaching, not just for themselves, but for those senior educators. One area of weakness that we identified in the needs analysis was that the meetings were being held like once or twice in the past and then just fading away because the senior educators sort of said, oh, hey, look, if you need any help, you know where I am, come and ask me a question. But a newer teacher often is a bit shy about doing that. So now there's a requirement for mentors to be setting a, a meeting every single week for 10 weeks. And we, and, we, and we ask them to check in with us um, uh, three times and also to fill out a checklist just to, so that we can check that those meetings are happening and find out why if they're not. Uh, and then, yeah, we have one more, one more element built in, which is what we call mentor advisors. And, and those are the people like myself who went to that formal training and that is to help the mentors. So we want to continually evaluate and the system and train our mentors. So we have mentor advisors that are matched up one-to-one, -one, uh, just sort of there to offer tips, guidance and support to just keep that continual improvement of mentoring happening. Um, I haven't got a slide about it, but the feedback that we've had over the two years has been really positive. So we've been running this for two years now. Last year, when we evaluated, we noticed some, we noticed some um, issues. So at the start of this year, actually, thanks to COVID, <laughs> I had a couple of weeks of non-teaching, a very unexpected non-teaching couple of weeks uh, after Chinese New Year. And I was actually able to sit down and spend two weeks going through and really overhauling some parts that weren't working so well. And the feedback this year has been even better. The main two questions where the feedback has shown us uh, that it's been positive is that all respondents to surveys have said that they find the system to be very useful in um, getting, uh, getting appropriate and professional support through a, a term of teaching. Uh, okay, let's go. I think I'm gonna be finished quite quickly. So we'll have some time for some discussion. Uh, we did develop another system. And in this other system, the idea was really more, even more about peer mentoring that there's no checklist or anything. It was more that an experienced teacher could request a mentor 
and we'd match them up and then we'd stay very much away from it. No, no formalized checklist, just a basic tracker to just see that the meetings are happening and still a mentor advisor just as a go-to if, if needed. Honestly, it hasn't really worked. This system um, take up has been very low. I, th I, re I think there's a few reasons why the uptake has been really low. I think one is that our teachers are just really busy people and they don't feel like they have the time to sit down and, and have these conversations, unfortunately. Um, I think also there's sort of that reluctance to admit to weakness or show weakness because they don't wanna be viewed as, as having a problem. Whereas obviously our managers actually would rather people admitted to their weaknesses and, and get help and, and better professional development. And then the other reason is I think we just didn't launch it very well. I see chats, let me. I'll answer those questions at the end, Dawn. Thank you. Um, keep them coming. <laughs> so we're, we're sort of looking at, A, if we continue to try and push the system, or B, if we just accept that it's not something that our teachers are wanting to formalize, that they are more comfortable just quietly going and finding a pair to help them, which does actually happen. I've personally had a go at this system and got some really great mentoring earlier this year. So it's sort of on something we're discussing and, and but you know, in 2020, other things have been a priority. But it's something that maybe next year we can revisit. Oh, surprising, I put animations on this one. <laughs> so in conclusion, our pair mentoring has worked. Our newer teachers feel much better supported. It's an absolute delight to walk around the office and see the conversations taking place. And they really are reciprocal conversations. Uh, it might sound like it's quite sort of mentor to mentee, but you sort of, when you see it in action, it's very, there is a lot of back and forth. And I think that these mentoring systems have become an absolutely key part of our professional development that we do in RMIT, SEUP. We, we have a lot of professional development, but this mentoring um, is a central part and something that is continually encouraged and pushed. And I haven't talked too much about the training that we give our senior educators, but twice a year, we all get together and have a coffee and we share experiences and we learn from each other. And through those conversations, we're building more of a community and that's allowing us to be more open and honest with each other. So we're, we're very much learning from each other in our training where we really do sit down in small groups and we talk and we talk and we talk and we share ideas, we share tips. And it is, no, it is noticeable that over time, they're becoming more confident with being able to mentor people and that the mentoring is more effective and productive. So we do have that training in place and we try to keep it quite informal because we really want this to be a community and that we can share ideas together. And I think that's really cool. Um, that's actually all I have, to be honest. And I'm, so when I practiced it, it, it ran a, a little bit longer, but that's good because we have some time to answer Dawn's questions uh, and, any, and any other questions as well. Um, so I can see them here in the chat box. Do you think that the system could be applied to career development as well? Okay, on that one, we deliberately keep career development out of the system because a, that was what the head of department wanted us to do. She wanted this system to be really focused on making better teachers and therefore better students, uh, helping our students more effectively. And we have line managers who take care of the career development side of things. So um, we, we do have that. And when I did the formalized training, career development was defined more in the coaching side of things rather than a mentoring side of things. 
So our line managers kind of coach us and support us in our career development. Um, if that answers that question. Okay, and then the checklist development. Um, well, myself and Martin, who put the system together, we've been working in RMIT for quite some time. So we already had a very good background knowledge in what new teachers needed. I, I've been responsible for new teacher inductions for about three years as well. So about one year prior to actually putting a system together. So I had already started seeing the gaps in knowledge through working with all the new teachers. So we put it together initially, and then we shared it with all of the coordinators. So like curriculum assessment, uh, the managers, student support, and they gave us input and then we edited and revised. Uh, that was the initial one. And then uh, the one we've put together this year because we had that bonus time because of COVID at the start of the year um we were able to go back to those same stakeholders and say hey look we've had feedback that parts of this are not working here's my proposal for changing it up and improving it so basically we structured it more with uh, subtitles and the stakeholders were impressed and wasn't much comment and it, it is it is significantly better um covid completely shut up closed all our classes for about three weeks so we all were on project time. We were actually still at work. We, we didn't get closed. Campus didn't get closed till March in Vietnam, um, but the students weren't there. Uh, we have been very lucky in Vietnam this year. The government's been looking after us very well. So we've got a very free life. We're, we're, we teach back on campus. We don't have any online teaching or anything anymore. We, we had it for two months, I think. Uh, and actually, uh, when we had the online teaching, we adapted certain parts of this mentoring system to immediately support teachers who were less comfortable with tech um, and tried to match people up to help. So that was pretty cool that we were able to also take parts of this and adapt very quickly. Uh, all senior educators, yes, there are possible mentors in the other system. Um, we, we assign it because it's part of job description and, and uh, KPIs for the year. So they can't really say no. <laughs> they could, the only time they might say no is if they think there's gonna be a personality clash and we, we, we would already know about that and wouldn't match them up anyway. Were there any other questions, comments? I kind of connected to that. I'm just wondering if the, the people, the mentees, um, do they get paid for um, taking part in these weekly meetings for 10 weeks? That's a good question because our new staff come in as hourly staff. Um, and no, it's part of their expected training that they do. Um, the way that our system works is that our staff are paid like uh, their teaching hour includes X amount of time of admin time. So it, it, it's, it's built into that admin time. But, but any, every other part of our induction process is paid, yeah, but not this part. Our mentors, our mentors, our senior educators are mostly salaried because we have a 60-40 split on that as well. So 60% full-time and 40% part-time. So by the time you get to senior educator level, you're generally full-time already. And because it's a job expectation written into the contract, we, we don't pay for that either. It's just, it's just part of what we do. And it's a pleasure. I, I, no one complains about it, they enjoy it. So that, that's a nice part too. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I might've missed this, but do the teachers observe each other's lessons? Um, they can do if they want to. Uh, I personally feel like it's a good idea and it does happen sometimes. The problem is that the way our, our streams work, we have a morning block and an afternoon block and there's very little time between. So the mentors and the mentees are always on the same block. So it's quite difficult for them to actually go into each other's classrooms because they're both teaching at the same time. Uh, but our managers are okay with jumping in and covering an hour of class from time to time if, if they want to. So yeah, occasionally. Um, and we do have developmental observations built in as well. Like that's part of being a senior educator as well as going and observing other teachers and then giving them support and feedback and 
um, that sort of sits parallel at the moment to this mentoring, but we're looking at how to better incorporate mentoring and observations together. Again, it was something on the drawing board at the start of the year that 2020 has just kicked in the guts as it has a lot of other things. Yeah, just, yeah, I can't really imagine mentoring somebody without them watching me or me watching them and then having a kind of, you know, discussion about what we, how we see things going in the classroom. I mean, I think it's great to have weekly conversations, but it, but for me anyway, it would be sort of without a context almost. No, I, I, I definitely hear you on that and in an ideal world, um, we would do that. So our new teachers do come in and observe a class before they start teaching and, and we do try and make that their their mentor so say eight times out of ten at least the new teacher does see their mentor teaching but not the other way around unfortunately okay yeah thanks I, I i hear you and i agree it's just the nature of how our system works we just can't <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. I'm really interested in the idea of peer mentoring. I work for the Jolt Writers Peer Support Group, which basically pairs a writer who wants to publish something with two peer readers. And we don't have a formalized checklist. And I think that's something that we should develop. As you say, kind of um, what deductively, we are looking at what's available and uh, decide what kind of elements need to be looked at. And then also, from kind of a adult leadership standpoint, having mentors for officers and mentors for new members, um, what kind of mentor training do, do the senior educators get? Is there a, a kind of program to um, induct them into becoming a mentor? Yes, there is. I'm running it next week, actually. We just got two new ones. Um, it's very much about sharing experiences. Um, sitting together and talking about what they think mentoring is. That's where we start the conversation, what they think it is, then defining what it actually is, because often the, the ideas are slightly off. Um, and then spending some time to talk about why we do it. We don't do it because it's in our job description. We do it because it helps us to reflect on, on our own teaching, which in turn makes us better teachers and then allows us to also share that experience and knowledge forward to help our colleagues become better teachers and to learn from them, right? Uh, and then I haven't looked at the training in a while. So it's the what, the definition, the why we do it, and then talking about success stories and also failures from past experience and what we might do differently. So that's the approach we take, a very reflective approach. And is there kind of structure to then the weekly meetings or is it more looking at the checklist and that provides the structure? That's right. Yeah, they, they just go through what they, the checklist. And I mean, they don't have to cover everything. I, I would share it with you, but it's got some things on it that I probably shouldn't share. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, it, it basically it's split into like four strands each week. So like strand one is administration, strand two will be assessment, strand three would be student support, strand four would be like other areas, and then strand five would be goal setting. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then so there's, the, there's sub points under that. So the mentors themselves don't necessarily receive training in um, how to mentor for those individual areas, but the checklist is kind of the, the training or the, the structure. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, they to be a senior to to get the promotion you need six months experience in rmat first so you can't um just jump in and be a senior educator you can't be hired at that level you've right. got to get the institutional experience first and it's quite a it's a really robust uh procedure to actually become a senior educator you've got to actually prove that you're already doing the job before you can be one there's a long job application interview process it's not just a, hey, I notice you're doing well, well done, you're, you're up. It's actually, everything in RMIT is very formalized because we're, we've, we're a big staff. Um, so we do operate in that sort of more institutional way where we have processes in place for pretty much everything. Great, thank you. By the way, it sounds really interesting what you're doing. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Dawn. Uh, our time is up.
if you guys would like to talk to each other, you can go to the hangout room uh, to carry on the conversation. Um, but I have to, uh, first of all, stop the recording.